Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Claire Stockwell, and I'm a Senior Climate Poli Policy Analyst with Climate Analytics. I will be your moderator for today's uh, virtual event by the Climate Action Tracker. Uh, I have with me today, um, starting on the climate analytics side, our CEO, Bill Hare, uh, as well as Claire Fison, who heads our, our mitigation pathways team. Uh, on the new climate side, I have Nicholas Herna, who is a founding member uh, of the New Climate Institute, as well as Louise Jeffrey, who uh, led along with Claire, the development of our new rating system, which we're here to present to you today. Uh, behind the scenes, um, I'm also assisted by Claire Waldman, um, Mia Moisio, uh, Maria Jose de, de Villafranca, who are assisting with uh, all the behind the scenes issues as well as will help out with our um, Q and A. Um, so in terms of the agenda today, we were looking or we're hoping to keep the presentations to around 30 minutes. Uh, Nicholas is going to start us off um, with just sort of setting the steams of where we are heading into the COP in Glasgow. That will be followed by Claire, who will give us an overview of the new the rating system that the Climate Action Tracker released um, in September. Uh, Louise will then go into some details on some of the key elements of the tracker, including the climate finance piece, as well as walk you through some examples of um, uh, key country uh, examples and how the, the rating system applies to, to at the country level. And then finally, Bill Hare will close out the, the presentations um, with some remarks on the expectations heading into the COP. Um, so before I hand it over to Nicholas, just a couple of housekeeping uh, points. This um, virtual event is being recorded. Uh, the slides and the recording will be available on the Climate Action Tracker's website. Um, if you would like to, after the presentation is finished, we're hoping to have about half an hour of Q&A. Um, so if you'd like, I'm sure by now you're all masters of Zoom, um, but just in case, a uh, little reminder that the Q&A button is in um, the bottom of your screen. And so please uh, submit your questions there. Feel free to submit the questions throughout the presentation. Um, we will try to get uh, to as many of those as possible during the Q&A, though I will apologize uh, in advance if we uh, aren't able to do so. Um, and I think with that, uh, I will hand it over to Nicholas. Thank you, Claire. Uh, indeed, and it's my pleasure to welcome you as well. Uh, from my uh, point of view, great that you're here and interested in what we are doing in the Climate Action Tracker. Uh, on the next slide, you will see uh, that we are tracking um, the NDCs that countries are putting forward. That is one of the main issues now for the COP coming up. Uh, the five-year or now extended six-year cycle that countries provide new nationally determined contributions to the Paris Agreement. And the question is, how far are we? And it's not only that countries should provide a new proposal, it should be more ambitious than the previous one. That's the rule of the uh, Paris Agreement uh, that you do that. Uh, please go back one slide. Um, here you can see uh, on our website, the Climate Action Tracker website, we have a little sub thing which we call Climate Target Update Tracker. You can see that quite a, a lot of countries have submitted already new and updated uh, uh, NDCs. The green ones are the ones that are have indeed submitted stronger targets than before. And the light green ones are the ones that have proposed stronger targets, but I have not officially submitted them. We assume that they will, but they haven't. So this is good. Countries are moving forward and proposing something new. However, there's also a whole category of countries that are that have not yet um, or that have submitted something, but it is not really um, more ambitious than before. In uh, one or two cases, it's even less ambitious than what they submitted five or six years ago. That's not good, and that's not in the spirit of the Paris Agreement, and um, countries need to rethink what they have uh, been doing. And then there's a, cat a category still of countries that have not yet submitted anything, um, and uh, those include countries of the G7, like India, um, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey, that have not submitted anything in this round. Now, the next... Um, figure you can see what that means so we want that countries provide more and more new ndcs until the gap is closed has that worked well it has worked to a certain extent you can see on this picture here the greenhouse gas emissions globally that went up since the 1990s uh, in the light blue here you see our estimate of the climate action tracker of all the pledges uh, 
uh, and NECs that countries have put forward. And uh, you can see that basically that means that global emissions will roughly stabilize until 2030, while they should be cut in half uh, to be in line with the Paris 1.5 uh, limit. That's the green line going down. And we, so we are basically um, emitting twice as much as we should be if we should would want to be in line with 1.5 of the Paris Agreement. So there's a huge gap. There's a huge discrepancy between where we want to be and where we currently are. Has this gap narrowed in this update process? Yes, it has. So the, the, on the right-hand side, you see two double arrows. One is from September 2020. There, before this update process, we estimated the gap as being 23 to 27 gigatons, so huge. Um, and the small uh, green thing on the right-hand side here in between the two arrows is showing that this has improved with new NDCs by roughly yeah, four gigatons or up to 15%. Um, this on the right-hand side, we show the May update. Actually, since May, not much has happened. Actually, nothing that you would really see on this scale of uh, things. Um, so it is better, but the gap is still huge. If we now go to the next slide, we show who has contributed to this narrowing. So the, this green bar is the same green bar that you've seen before in absolute tons of uh, CO2 emissions. And you can see the green small bars are which countries have contributed to narrowing the gap. And well, the biggest contribution comes from the US. They come from zero, not being part of the Paris Agreement as, at all, not having a, an NDC. That's at least what we have in our assessment. And going from no NDC to now a relatively ambitious one uh, definitely reduces the global gap significantly. Also countries like Europe uh, or the group of countries in Europe have uh, updated their target. China has made a proposal um, that is actually for the size of China still a little step forward. Probably that could be a little bit more, but then countries like Japan, UK, Canada, Argentina, Ukraine, and you would have to add on this list probably uh, South Korea, which came uh, a bit later than May, um, but it will be in the order of of Ukraine, I would say, so you can't really see it on this screen, on this scale. You see the red one going up from Brazil and others. Uh, that is basically because Brazil has proposed something that leads to higher emissions than their previous proposal that they did five years ago. That is uh, contrary to the spirit of the Paris Agreement. And on the right hand side, we list again the countries that have submitted basically the same thing or something that is not leading to lower emissions. And those countries definitely urgently need to rethink their um, their proposal so far. Since we have this huge, huge gap, um, every country needs to go back to rethink their proposals. Uh, the next slide shows you the what does what I had focused so far is the gap in 2030. We are always thinking about the long term until the end of the century. What will be the temperature increase by the end of the century? Um, due to the NDCs, but uh, what is important here to note is that this temperature increase is not only driven by the NDCs until 2030, but actually more so driven by the long-term targets, so by the targets that the country set themselves for 2050 or even beyond. And those we include in our temperature assessment if these long-term targets have been officially enshrined in law or officially submitted to the UNFCCC. And there you can see our NDC announcements and uh, submissions um, lead to a temperature increase of 2.4 degrees by the end of the century. That's the lowest number we have ever had, um, which is a very good sign. And that means uh, there is some progress, but 2.4 is still away from the well below 2 or 1.5. We even have an optimistic assessment if we take into account all net zero targets, so targets that countries have uh, adopted or are discussing. So that would include also China, for example, uh, which has said that they want to go to net zero by 2060. That has a huge impact. And here our number is 2.0 degrees by the end of the century. So if all countries really do what they have promised in net zero terms, then uh, we could, uh, the Paris Agreement goals 
could come in reach again. But uh, downside is the last temperature estimate, and that's our 2.9 degrees temperature estimate. That's actually with everything that countries are doing right now, not what they propose, but what they are really doing, what they have implemented in national adopted policies. And that is worrying because 2.9 degrees is really high. And uh, that would mean catastrophic climate change and something we really need to avoid. That's the global picture. Um, with that, I hand over uh, to Claire Feisen to run you through our new country rating system. Great, thank you, Nicholas. So I'm sure many of you will have seen we've had quite a revamp of our rating system. Uh, and so we're going to use the time today to introduce you to the changes that we made um, and hopefully answer some of your questions on what, what's changed for specific countries. Um, so let's start off with why are we updating our methods? Well, since the CAT started about just over a decade ago, we're in quite a different place. So back then we had a two degree goal that we were heading for. Um, we had lower emissions back then, so you could see that um, quite easy yellow trajectory um, has now converted in this Paris Agreement world into a very steep uh, 1.5 trajectory that we need to, to reach the Paris Agreement's 1.5 degree goal, um, starting from now a much higher starting point than we had over a decade ago. Um, so this means that to, 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 to keep that 1.5 goal within reach, we really need all countries to decarbonize as quickly as possible. We also know that, as Nicholas just outlined, our targets are not on track, they're heading for 2.4, but even more alarmingly, our current policies are heading for 2.9, well above um, those targets, so really not on track. And so it's important to also take into consideration where these policies are taking us, and that's something new that we've now incorporated into our rating system. And finally, we, we know that if the whole world is to get to 1.5, is to get their emissions down um, to, to net zero by around mid-century, then this really means that developed countries need to provide support for developing countries so that they can decarbonize at the necessary pace. And so this is something that we have also now taken into account. So what has changed? Um, well, Previously, as hopefully most of you know, we assessed whether or not a government's target is in line with its fair share. Um, we continue to do that. That still continues to be a key component of our new rating system. But we now also disentangle what should be done domestically within a country um, with international support when, when necessary. Um, we also look for developed countries, whether they are providing sufficient climate finance um, to meet their fair share, and we look at whether or not the policies and actions that are being put in place on the ground are um, on track. Um, we also have, you can see in this diagram, two additional elements that don't feed into our overall rating, but they are still also important. So firstly, we flag those countries for which land use and forestry emissions or removals are important, an important component for the country in meeting its NDC. Um, and we also do an evaluation of any net zero targets that have been brought forward by a country. This doesn't feed into the overall rating because we think that really 2030 is the decisive year for getting on track um, for 1.5 and also for countries to achieve their long-term goals. And Louise will go into that a little bit later on. Um, so our system works slightly differently for developed and developing countries to recognize their different circumstances um, and different starting points. So let's look at what different types of country need to do to get a good rating. So first of all, for a developed country, they need to set a domestic target for their emissions at home that are consistent with, at least with um, a global least cost pathway that's compatible with 1.5 degrees. So they need to decarbonize very, very rapidly domestically. Um, they also need to set policies that are in line with those targets. So they need to implement the target, but they also need to do their fair share. And this is where our previous framework comes in. So a developed country should set um, an international target so they could um, include in this emissions reductions that are achieved um, abroad, so through supporting developing countries, and they can also provide climate finance um, to make up for any gap, and together that should all contribute to a developed country's fair share, and they need to provide enough finance to, to make up, um, to get a good rating. Uh, so what does that look like? Well. I'll walk you through an example of the EU and Louise will come to some other examples later on. 
So if you focus, um, first of all, on the left hand side, uh, this shows our models domestic pathway framework and what you can see here. So the black line shows um, historical emissions turning into the blue line for where the EU's policies are currently heading for by 2030 and then the black dot is the EU's NDC, its domestic target. And in the background, you can see um, diff uh, different pathways representing different temperature levels from 1.5 in the green up to through yellow, orange, and red, which would be four degree compatible world. And these are derived from global least cost pathways assessed by the IPCC, um, consistent with these different temperature levels. And they give an indication of what a country, how, where a country needs to be to be in track with um, decarbonizing its economy and for a developed country really represents the minimum effort that they should be doing. And you can see here that the EU is, um, so just briefly back, uh, the EU is um, consistent with a two degree world. So it's, it's not 1.5 aligned, it's, it's more consistent with a two degree world. Then we go on to the right hand side. So this is a different framework, our, our previous framework, and this shows um, fair share emissions uh, ranges in 2030 that we draw from the literature and we supplement this with our own calculations as well. And this takes into account normative assumptions on what um, could make up a fair share. So it's based on principles of historical responsibility, capability, need and equality. Um, and uh, for developed countries, um, this can be achieved through domestic emissions reductions, but also through providing support to um, developing countries um, in the form of climate finance or other forms of support. And so you can see um, for the EU here that its domestic target is, is not en enough to be its fair share. It's in the in insufficient um, world there and its climate finance, which Louise will go into greater detail later, is also not enough to make up for that gap between where the EU's target is and where it would need to be to be um, contributing its fair share, which is that green bar right at the bottom. So that's a developed country example. Um, now let's go to a developing country. So what would a developing country need to do? First of all, they would need to set a, um, again, a domestic target, um, but this time in line with its fair share. So this is what we expect um, a developing country to be able to do with its own resources um, on its own territory. So Claire, I think you need to, yeah, there we go. So set a target in line with its fair share. It also needs to set policies in line with its fair share to meet that target. And this is a distinction between the developing and developed countries, which I will also explain a bit later. Uh, but still developing countries need to decarbonize in line with um, what's needed globally to, to be online with a, a least cost pathway to 1.5. And so there they need international support to get onto that pathway. So they also need to set an internationally supported target. Um, and this in many cases is, is framed as a conditional target. Um, and what does this look like? So for an example here, we have Ethiopia. So this time, let's start on the right hand side, the fair share framework where we evaluate um, Ethiopia's fair share target. So this is Ethiopia's unconditional NDC, what it's going to do with its own resources and Ethiopia's policies and actions in blue there, which are actually below um, where Ethiopia's target is heading. And you can see that Ethiopia is well into the 1.5 degree compatible um, rating there. So it's, it's doing its fair share because it has such low historical responsibility, capability, these other dimensions that go into the fair share. But then on the left hand side, you can see that this isn't enough to decarbonize. So you can see where um, Ethiopia's internationally supported target is shown there by the white circle. So this is Ethiopia's um, conditional target. And there it's well into the red. So it's in line with a, a four degree world when it's assessed based on model domestic pathways. And so it's very clear that, e that Ethiopia would need international support and would need to set a conditional target that's much lower that causes its emissions to go down. And a good starting point would be to bring its um, conditional target in line with its um, policies and actions that would already be an improvement. So um, that's two, two good examples. Um, this is in a nutshell what our new rating system looks like. So with a, a less, a worse example and a better, well, a very good example here. Um, we show the ratings for each of the individual elements that, that go into our overall rating in addition to the net zero and the land use and forestry components there. But for each country, we also come up with an overall rating um, to give it an idea of where that country is with respect to other countries. And there's only really one 
true 1.5 compatible rating, the green. So that's that means a country is doing really well across the board. And the other um, almost sufficient down to critically insufficient are different levels of um, being off track, basically. So most countries fall into those categories of not yet being Paris sufficient, Paris agreement compatible. Um, some are closer than others. And so this is the distinction that we make between them. How do we get to this overall rating? This is shown in, the, yeah, in this diagram here. So the principles behind um, coming up with this overall rating, we tried to balance both policies and targets. We feel that both are very important to take into account. And we also, um, as best as we can, tried to balance the two frameworks that we use, the fair share and the domestic pathway frameworks. Um, and we also had to develop a system that works for all countries, which um, takes into account all of these different circumstances that different countries are in. Um, so on the policy side, um, as I've explained before, we, we evaluate policies um, based on what a country, what we expect a government to do with their own resources and domestically. So for developed countries, that means um, we expect them to be in line with the global least cost 1.5 pathway. For developing countries, we assess their policies against what would be a fair share and in, in general. And that comes out as being kind of the better of those two ratings we take forward. On the left-hand side now, looking at um, the targets, uh, you can see uh, for developed countries, we first look at um, whether or not they're providing enough climate finance to make up for any gap um, to, to meeting their fair share. In this case, no, they're not. So we take the, the fair share rating still. We then combine that with the domestic target rating. So we combine the domestic target with the fair share assessment. And we average those. If the two ratings are right next to each other, so if it was, say, um, insufficient and highly insufficient, we would give the worst of the two. So we don't want to, um, we want to, countries to be doing well across the board to get a good rating. So that then gives us a, a target rating, and then we combine the targets and policies rating together again by averaging, and again by taking the worst if, if the, the two are right next to each other. And that gives us um, our overall rating. And in the next slide, you can see what this looks like for all of the countries that we look at. Um, you can see only the Gambia of all the countries you look at, the Gambia is the only one that gets a 1.5 compatible rating, although um, we are in the process of updating this because the Gambia has provided a new NDC recently. Um, for the other countries, we can go into some examples later. Some have changed from previously because of this update in the rating system, others have changed because of new targets or changes in their policies. So there's quite a lot of um, moving parts here. Now I will hand over to Louise to go into a few more details of the rating system. Thanks very much, Claire, and for that great explanation. Yes, as Claire said, I'll take you through a few more details, um, in particular on the finance component of our rating, and I'll also briefly touch on the net zero and land use elements that we've been assessing. And finally, then to walk you through a few examples of individual countries and how this uh, rating system that Claire's just explained actually plays out um, when we do a country assessment. But first to start off with the climate finance, and here again I'd just like to reiterate a couple of points that Claire's made, because they're particularly important for the climate finance assessment. As you've seen, we basically now have two references for one and a half, one and a half degrees, a fair share and a model domestic pathway. And these two one and a half degree benchmarks have different meanings in terms of what we ask different countries to do. In the case of developed countries, such as the EU here on the left, the model domestic pathway represents the least that a country should be doing at home, so with its own borders. However, this in general, particularly for developed countries, falls short of what would be needed for a fair share contribution. So developed countries, again, such as the EU, um, basically have two options. They can strengthen their domestic target a bit if they want to, but then they also, and more likely, need to provide support to others to reduce their emissions. And that often comes through providing climate finance, although there are other options. Um, this, uh, the amount of finance they need to provide needs to essentially make up for this gap between their domestic um, action and their fair share. And this gap is different for different countries. If you, if you look through our analysis, you will find that, uh, particularly for the UK, the gap is very, very large. And this indicates that they then need to provide quite a lot of additional climate finance. Whereas for others, the gap may be quite smaller. They still need to provide a bit of climate finance, but maybe not quite as much. 
to re-emphasize why how important this is, um, we look at the right hand side here. And this is the case of India, whose one and a half degree fair share might allow for a slight increase in emissions in the next 10 years. But we know that to meet our target of reducing emissions by 50% in the next 10 years, that requires action from all, and it requires everyone to get onto a decarbonization pathway. But clearly from fair share principles, India shouldn't be doing this alone. They require that support, and that support has to come from these developed countries. To actually translate um, uh, finance into uh, um, mitigation in terms of emission reductions is really challenging. Um, so the CAT has tried to uh, take some first steps towards doing that. And that's what I'm going to walk you through today. So what we want to do is to evaluate the quality and the quantity of climate finance provided by developed countries. And so we ask four different questions. The first of these and the most important of them is to look at current contributions. How much climate finance has the country provided to date? And we evaluate the sufficiency of that finance in two ways. The first is by looking at this gap between the fair share and the model domestic pathway. So how much um, should the country be providing as a whole and compare that between countries that should be providing climate finance. So again, somebody to provide a greater share than others. And we then relate that to benchmarks that relate to the total amount of finance that's needed. The minimum standard that we have is the 100 billion that developed countries have promised to deliver, but it's quite clear that overall, even more climate finance will be needed. To get a good rating, a developed country would need to a good climate finance rating, a country would need to provide their fair share of the total climate finance of up to four times the 100 billion in order to be rated well on climate finance or on the current contributions. With the rest of the climate action tracker, we often look more to the future and towards promises. And so we want to add a few additional elements to our climate finance mitigation here. And those are the next three questions. One, we look at the trend. Um, there's an expectation that countries should be essentially increasing climate finance through time. And we want to do a check on the countries that they are doing that and delivering on that. It's also really important that uh, climate finance is predictable. And so we look at what countries have committed to in the future. Has the country committed to further support? Are they committed to an increase in that support? And is that uh, commitment really trustable and clear? Finally, it's also really important that countries are not providing climate finance on the one hand, and on the other hand, also supporting fossil fuel infrastructure. And so we rate the country on whether or not they have committed or actually stopped, committed to or actually stopped funding fossil fuels overseas. We have a few uh, sort of important assumptions to highlight here. First of all, our and a climate finance rating really focuses on mitigation finance only. That does not mean that adaptation and loss and finance damage aren't important. They most certainly are. And the CAT expects countries also to step up to provide finance for these. But in terms of our overall rating system, that's very much focused on mitigation. And we wanted to separate the two. And so our rating to date only looks at mitigation finance. In our analysis, we also prioritize grants and uh, funding that's provided as grants, but we also count about 50% of the loan share towards the total in our assessments. Finally, we exclude private finance and finance for fossil fuels in our assessment. And for those interested, we use the DAC database. It's our basis for this analysis. You can find more details of the methods on our website, and I won't go into those now, but I would like to show you briefly the results. So what does this look like um, in terms of the actual ratings for different countries. I think most important to highlight is that no country rates well on international climate finance, but some are clearly doing better than others. Norway, Germany, and the EU all receive an insufficient overall climate finance rating. But here I will highlight that it's only Norway that in terms of absolute contributions manages to get an insufficient rating. And that's actually only just. So Norway is the only country that has just provided its fair share of the 100 billion is what this means. Other countries are doing much worse, including overall Japan, Australia, the US and Russia land towards the bottom of the pile. We do see some hope in terms of recent announcements for future commitments. You can see the uh, more yellow shading there in the third column. Um, but we do see um, still more expected and more needed there. Um, the recent announcements aren't sufficient and they're not clear and um, backed up sufficiently. And there's still far too much funding for fossil fuel overseas, and we need more countries to step up and stop doing that. I'd like to take you um, 
now through a couple of the other additional elements that we described earlier. Um, the first of these is net zero. Um, many countries have been putting forward net zero targets in the last year or two, and these are super important for the long term perspective um, and help us to orient where these new tar targets need to go. Um, the CAT has started to analyze these and we do so based on a framework of good practice and the CAT has um, identified 10 elements um, that assess the robustness of a good net zero target and that's focused around three elements. Um, the scope, um, so this includes aspects such as whether or not it includes international aviation and shipping or the broader overall emissions coverage. We also look at the architecture of the net zero target. So what's the legal status? Is it clear um, how land use and removals, emissions removals should contribute to that? And finally, the transparency of it. Um, how clear is it? Is it easy to understand? Um, and do you include elements such as uh, fairness? As Claire said, the net zero does not um, enter into the overall rating, but we think it's important that you see this. And if you want to understand it for an individual country, again, please go to the country page on the CAT website. The second element that we find important to assess, but does not contribute to the overall rating is land use and forests. The CAT rating um, and the CAT analysis assesses emissions excluding those from land use and forestry, because it's, these are so important to get onto a decarbonization pathway and going towards zero. However, land use is still important. So we now flag um, whether land use in a particular country is a significant emission source or a significant emission sink. And we hope to develop that further in the next coming years. But just to let you know for now, that's what we're able to do and what you can find on our website. So what does this look like when we actually apply it at the country level? Our first example um, is the upcoming COP president and my home country, the UK. Um, and the graphs you're going to see here are the same structure as those that Claire has shown you earlier in explaining how the rating is structured. The UK gets an overall almost sufficient rating um, and in that sense stands out from other developed countries. And the reason it does so is that its domestic target is the only one that is consistent with the one and a half degree model domestic pathway. So this black dot on the left hand side you see here. So on this um, element of the rating, it does well. However, it is still not Paris Agreement compatible overall. The UK needs to implement additional policies to improve its rating on policies and actions to actually meet that domestic target. And furthermore, the UK is still a long way from meeting its overall fair share contribution. The UK needs to step up substantially on international climate finance in order to be able to meet its fair share contribution. Moving on to the US, uh, which gets a weaker rating of overall insufficient. The new targets set by the Biden administration are good, but they're still not sufficient to be rated one and a half degree compatible. So this black bar that you see on the left hand side, we rate as almost sufficient. That would be sufficient to be a two degree compatible, but not 1.5. Even more so than in the UK, the US's current policies and action are not sufficient to even meet that domestic target and need substantial improvement. It's worth noting that this current assessment doesn't include the major bills currently before Congress, um, but the, we cannot do that yet and we'll do so in, in the coming weeks if and when they do go through. As with the UK, um, this still leaves the US also well behind on the fair share and the, uh, the US even rates uh, weaker on climate finance where it's rated critically insufficient. Moving on then to China, we see that China's policies and actions, so the blue bar are quite consistent with their current NDC but all are rated insufficient against model domestic pathways and highly insufficient when rated against their fair share. We are hoping to see a new NDC from China in the current coming weeks. And if there were an improvement, there is a chance that China's overall rating could improve, particularly when you see it rated against the fair shares. Um, moving on to India, that has the same overall rating as China, so highly insufficient. And this highly insufficient rating is mainly driven by its very weak targets. You'll see that um, it's right there, targets are rated critically insufficient uh, when rated against model domestic pathways and highly insufficient when rated against their fair shares. And what's important to point out here is that these targets are well above what we estimate emissions will be under current policies and action. 
If India were to improve its target just to the level of the current policies, it would get an overall insufficient rating, so one better. However, um, what we would hope is that these, both the targets and the policies would be improved even further. And in particular, in the case of India, it would be good to see an improved conditional target that could then outline what would be needed to get onto an actual decarbonization pathway and the support that it would need to do that. Our final example today is Morocco. And we're showing Morocco because it's quite a nice example in terms of uh, what we ask a country to do. So Morocco has put forward an unconditional domestic target here on the right hand side in black that is consistent with meeting its one and a half degree fair share. Under current policies and action, um, we actually estimate that Morocco will have even lower emissions in 2030 than that target. Um, however, um, you can see that these emissions are still increasing and what would we would like to see is for that curve to be bent and the blue shaded area to be heading more towards this white circle on the left hand side, which is Morocco's um, conditional target or we're rating it as our internationally supported target. So Morocco is requesting um, support in order to bend the curve and actually start to um, decrease its emissions. I think it's worth highlighting here also that um, Morocco would only need to increase this uh, or improve this internationally supported target by a small amount to make it hit the one and a half degree model domestic pathway. And if it did, we'd actually get an overall uh, one and a half degree um, compatible assessment. I hope these few examples outline how the, the, the rating system can be used, um, the different components that we have, and what you can now learn in a bit more detail about the country. I'm going to hand over to Bill, who's going to talk about what we can expect in the next few weeks and especially at COP26. Bill. Thanks, Louise, and uh, thanks to the Climate Action Tracker team. Um, it's been a massive job to update this whole um, assessment system, and I'd like to also add my welcome to everyone who's uh, joined now to listen to what the team's been doing. I just want to be very brief now because I want to move to the most interesting part, which is to uh, chat with you about your questions. We're heading into COP26, everyone knows that. The big question is, how are we traveling? And um, I wanted to step out a bit, look at the big picture here. And this is a figure which uh, we, we developed with the Climate Action Tracker to answer that question ourselves. How is it going? Has the Paris Agreement had an impact? And to cut a long story short here, we see a significant improvement in both uh, the implemented policies of countries and in their uh, overall commitments. The current policies are in the blue line and the commitments, the pledges and targets are in the gray curve. And you see that uh, in Paris, uh, uh, current policies were well over three and a half degrees, uh, commitments down around 2.7. As you can see on the commitment side, um, that, that wound back a bit with the Trump uh, uh, departure from the uh, Paris Agreement and also Russia rolling back. But there's been significant improvement. So just ahead of the COP now, we can see, and we've heard already, that uh, current policies are still a long way from where they need to be. Um, they're really close to three degrees, actually 2.9. And the, um, the uh, big, big issue here is the emergence of net zero targets. And we can discuss that in question time, but that significantly improves depending upon your level of optimism about their implementation, the outlook, including towards two degrees. So we stand now, as we've heard, with a very big emission gap ahead of Glasgow and the big challenge is to close it. Next slide, please. Now, um, in, in the NDC update game, there are a number of countries that have actually not updated their NG NDCs, or if they have, they have just resubmitted the old, old very weak target. Uh, these countries include uh, in one hemisphere, Brazil and Mexico. Uh, we see even a country like Switzerland has not updated its target significantly. India, Turkey, Kazakhstan, Saudi Arabia have yet to submit an update, nor have Australia, um, Indonesia, New Zealand, Singapore, Thailand submitted one with a better target. So quite a big uh, set of gaps there. And I guess we could be optimistic and hope that some of these countries will move forward. We know, for example, that New Zealand intends to announce a new target in the next week or so and submit that to the Paris Agreement. Next slide, please. There are also uh, countries where, uh, that we're monitoring that we're aware have incoming announcements they've made. They made announcements about improving their NDCs. Argentina, China, South Korea of the countries that we track. Uh, 
have uh, yet to submit their announced targets. We are hoping that they do, and that maybe they're even better than what they've announced. So I think uh, that's a nut I'm not sure where we are now. I'd like to hand back to Claire, Claire Stockwell, to facilitate the live questions. Claire, back to you. Great. Thanks very much, Phil. And thank you to all the attendees. You have submitted a large number of questions, uh, so we have a huge stack to work through. Uh, we will try and get through uh, as many of them as possible um, in the remaining uh, minutes uh, that we have in this the, the webinar. So the first question that we'll take um, is about the CAT thermometer. Uh, so the CAT last updated its temperature assessment for where current targets and pledges would get us in May, and that was 2.0 four degrees. Um, and the question is, how does that relate to the recent assessment that the UNFCCC put out in terms of their synthesis um, of where the NDC stand uh, and their estimate was 2.7 degrees. So actually, if I could ask Bill, if you could come back in and uh, and um, give us some, some updates and explanations for the difference between the CAT thermometer approach and uh, and the UNFCCC uh, approach, and then also the other panelists, feel free to, to jump in. Um, Oh, great. Thanks, Claire. Look, um, there's obviously scientific and methodological differences between the two, but the, the big story is that um, over time, the current policy projections are indeed moving down, downwards in all assessments. There were three or more, uh, and now they're below three for most studies that we're aware, we're aware of, including all. The um, question is whether you include the, uh, the net zero commitments that some countries have and how you judge those to be significant enough. And as uh, Nicholas outlined at the beginning, uh, we have a number of countries that we do include those net zero goals where they're legislated and they have strong commitments and do also in some ways connect with the NDC. So that gets us um, a bit lower than others. Um, so matter of methodology, but the overall pattern is the current policies are improving, but obviously not fast enough. Great, thank you, Bill. Um, the next question that we have is related to the net zero targets. Um, as we've seen, there's been a significant wave of net zero targets um, in the past couple of years. And this, the question relates to the fact that these are uh, much longer term targets and are they really sometimes not really related to credible laws, uh, policies and measures? So how do we include this discrepancy in terms of what is promised and what is actually happening in the ground and how does that affect our ratings? So I was wondering, uh, Claire, if I could ask you to, to come in on the, the elements of, of net zero. Yeah, thanks Claire. Um, it's, a, it's a really good question. And um, yeah, I mean, the reason that, as I said, we, we in, in our rating system, when we really rate what a country is doing, we look at 2030 because the near-term action is really what is decisive in getting onto a 1.5 pathway, and it's also a time frame over which we can have more confidence in, in whether or not governments are on track to meet that. Um, but 2050 net zero targets are really important for kind of setting the trajectory as well. A number of governments have put in place net zero targets, and we hope that they then um, bring forward 2030 targets that are in line with those net zero targets. Um, if you look at our evaluation um, of different net zero targets, one of the factors that we include is the, the, the status and architecture of that target. So is it legally binding? Um, does it have a good review process? Uh, is the country tracking progress against that target? Um, and have they been transparent in the assumptions, the planning that's gone into the target, what, what pathway they actually intend to follow to get there so that we can understand whether or not it is um, a realistic target, whether it's one that they are actually kind of putting in the hard yards to achieve. Um, and so, yeah, you can see um, from our results, if you look on our website, you can see the results of that um, evaluation for a number of different countries and actually very few are providing what we would consider to be all of the details that you need to, to really have confidence in a net zero target and to know that the government has put in the thinking that it needs to on how to get there. Um, so yeah, it is a really important question and I think we should make sure that we don't just all get kind of excited about all of these net zero targets and, and lose sight of whether or not governments are putting in the efforts and the, and the thinking in the near term. Fantastic. Uh, thanks, Claire. Um, so the next question that we have is a, a rather general one, which is the um, what are the main reasons, sort of the main rationale behind updating our rating system? And I was wondering, Bill, would you like to start us off there? 
Thanks. Yeah, well, it was a, a question that the CAT team often asked itself during the arduous task of updating this. Why did we start this? But it's for a very good reason that um, when the Climate Action Tracker started back um, a thousand years ago in Copenhagen, um, I mean, 12 years, I guess, the whole focus was on fair share. That is what countries put forward as a contribution. And that has been the dominant part of our um, tracking system since then. But the world is more complicated um, and we realize that we need to track the different main elements of what countries are, are doing and need to do or on the developing countryside need to receive on climate finance. So we looked at um, what, what countries are doing in terms of real action in their economies, what are their domestic targets, what are their actions and policies to implement those. We looked at how countries are contributing to the overall Paris Agreement. Uh, through not just uh, their own action, but through uh, providing climate finance um, on, on the side of the developed countries. And we looked on the other side, uh, are developing countries putting markers out there to say we need to get additional resources in order to be able to get to the one and a half degree pathway? And how do those different targets they're putting forward match up? So that in a nutshell is the reason why we did it. The, the world is a lot more complicated. Um, we judged the user community out there um, based on all the input over the years would find this a bit more complicated, but would provide a lot more granularity. Great. Thank you, Bill. Um, maybe just building on, on that question, we had a couple of questions related to the methodology. So specifically around explaining the methodology on the fair share contributions in a little bit more detail, as well as how we distribute the, the ratings depending on emissions. Um, the country size, the population and things like that. So I was wondering if I could uh, ask Louise to come in on those finer points on the methodology. Sure, happy to Claire. I will try and give my best explanation of that in a short amount of time. Um, so when we want to assess a country based on its fair share, we base our analysis on the academic literature and some of our own calculations on what it is required for a country to uh, meet its fair share emissions. And the literature is based on many, many different principles and indicators. Some of these principles uh, include historic responsibility for past emissions, so historic responsibility for contribution to climate change, but also include aspects such as the country's current capacity, um, what's their GDP, do they have um, essentially the financial capacity to, to address their own emissions. Um, there are also other elements, including equality, which addresses partly the emissions per capita element. And what we do is we, we combine all of this literature information and some of our own calculations based on the same principles um, to get what we call a fair share range for each country. So a range of emissions that would be consistent, could be consistent with consistent could be considered consistent with their fair share um, for each of those countries. But what we find is those fair share ranges are quite big. And if you were to go to the top of the range for all countries, for example, then you would get emissions that are much too high to be consistent with one and a half degrees. So we then we go down that range until we find an emissions level where we sum it across all countries that we actually hit the one and a emissions level consistent with one and a half degrees. Um, that also allows us to construct our different temperature ratings, so you can also look at the emissions level that will be consistent with two or three degrees globally. Um, that's how we construct that particular fair share range. I think if you want more information, we do actually have quite a lot of details on our website and in the methodology document, or feel free to get in touch with us for more detailed clarifications. Thanks, Claire. Great, thank you, Louise. But maybe keeping on um, some methodology points, uh, the next question we have is about, do, um, does our assessment of country emissions, is it based on the uh, production base, um, uh, emissions from production, or is it on the consumption level? And do we plan to assess a country's level of ambition based on their um, consumption-based uh, emissions? Um, Nicholas, could I get you to, to weigh in on that question? Yeah, thanks. Uh, very good question, and we get it quite a lot. Um, we have used this accounting framework as it is defined by the UNFCCC, because this is well, we are doing this for the Paris Agreement, and this is how national governments are accounting for their emissions, and that is production based. So the emissions within the territory of the country, excluding uh, uh, international aviation and shipping. Um, so first, con consumption versus uh, production. So that's the 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 production way of doing it is how it is uh, 
defined under the UNFCCC. There's a merits for including consumption as well, but it's complicated. Uh, it includes the consumption of the developed countries, for example, importing a lot of emissions from, from products that are produced elsewhere or in other countries as well. But if you take this uh, system seriously, you have to do it the other way around as well. Uh, countries producing um, things that reduce greenhouse ga gas emissions elsewhere, like uh, supporting renewables and things like that. And then the whole thing becomes very complicated. I think it's useful to do. We have not planned to go into details in the near future, but we could uh, add it as an element uh, of, of looking at it. But right now we are really focusing on the uh, production-based uh, accounting. And while I was on the accounting, Claire, maybe I can take uh, the, the next one there on the international aviation, which is uh, we again use the accounting method of the UNFCCC, which excludes international aviation and shipping. And that's why on the website you may have seen, we have separate assessments of international aviation and international shipping. Unfortunately, both are not featured well. Uh, international aviation is critically insufficient and shipping is highly insufficient. These two sectors are moving slow. But I, well, just to mention something positive is that in shipping, it seems there is some movement. There's some new announcement recently on retailers wanting to go have all their shipping emissions reduced to zero by 2040 already. Uh, and that is, I think, a good announcement. But on the international level, unfortunately, both sectors are very, very uh, slow and uh, not moving as, not at all moving as fast as they should. Over to you, Claire. Great, thank you, Nicholas. Um, so the next question we have is the relationship between having a pledge, uh, making a pledge and whether that's actually driving um, emission reductions in terms of policy implementation. So we know in the Paris Agreement that um, there's a requirement on countries to have to keep coming forward with stronger and stronger pledges, but is that going to actually lead to further ambition or just more unrealistic pledges because they aren't actually implemented? Um, Bill, would you like to start us off on this one? Yeah, it, it's a very good question, and there's no simple answer. I think um, my perspective is that uh, when countries set targets, it does create um, incentives and internal pressure to meet them, but there are a class of countries where that is not true, where, where pledges are set in a way that are basically uh, far away from current policies, and the government has really no intention of doing anything apart from turning up at an international meeting with an announcement. So I think that's uh, a critical question. Um, one of the, the values of the Climate Action Tracker is it will enable you um, to basically assess whether that's going on, whether a country is indeed serious about uh, meeting its pledges uh, with current policies. You can see it not just in the, the, the top level graphs, but also in the very rich analyses that is on each country page, which is often updated regularly and provides a lot of first rate information. So um, it does come down a lot to the kind of pressure that uh, national level stakeholders can put on a country to really honour uh, what it has put forward. But in general, uh, when targets are set, um, we observe countries really do try and meet them in the best cases. And there are a lot of really good, good examples around the world of that. Great, thanks very much, Bill. Um, just uh, keeping an eye on the time, uh, I think we probably have time for one more question and then I would give each of the panelists just one minute to uh, sum up. So the, the final question is, um, can you provide an indication of how you've taken into account LULUCF into the ratings uh, and for those countries for which it is relevant? Uh, Louise, could you? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Claire. Yeah, a, a good question and, and good, I think, uh, to highlight <laughs> the land use sector again. It, it is important, uh, as we said. Um, so just to reiterate that the 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 LULUCF flag or, or rating or marking is relevant, doesn't influence our overall rating, um, but we do want to be able to show on a country page, for example, and in our analysis, when LULUCF is relevant for that country. And, and relevance can mean a couple of different things. Um, 
what we do to determine whether a country is flagged or not is to look at the historic contribution from land use to total emissions. And essentially we flag when that historical contribution um, of either a sink or a source is above 20% of um, all the other emissions or emissions from other sources. So it's really just to say is our emissions or the sink from land use um, substantial, <laughs> large in size when compared to total emissions. Um, and there are a couple of reasons why this can then be relevant for the country and why it's important to classified as relevant. Sometimes that comes into the accounting um, and there are some countries for which um, they can disguise an increase in emissions, for example, um, by interesting accounting with the land use sector. Um, for others such as Brazil or Indonesia, it's simply um, large emissions from deforestation and these really do need to be taken into account and addressed as well. Um, maybe just briefly to explain why we, we have both and why we have them separate. So we it's really important that we monitor emissions excluding LULUCF because those are the ones that really need to be reduced drastically and rapidly. The land use sector is more complicated, but that doesn't mean it's not also important. Um, we just need to treat it in a slightly different way and analyze it in a different way. Thanks, Claire. Great, thank you, Louise. Um, Nicholas, could I get your final thoughts? Yeah, in general, I'm always torn between the positive and the negative. Well, let me start with the positive. Um, We've, we've been doing this for, I don't know, 12 years now and had this temperature estimate. And we finally get temperature estimates that are somewhere close to the goals of the Paris Agreement. So if we take into account all of the, the whole wave of net zero targets and take them into account, we get as low as 2 degrees, 2.0, which is for the first time ever somewhere close to where we want to be. So this is really good. And I think a total game changer. It's not a question of whether we go to zero it's now a question of when we go to zero and who goes first. This is a very, very different picture uh, to only a few years ago, which is very positive. However, there comes the negative. The short-term gap is huge. Not a single country has sufficient policies in place to put itself in line with its net zero pledge. Not a single country has sufficient policies in place to do that. And that is very worrying. The gap for 2030, the short-term gap is huge. And we have only to a limited extent uh, narrowed it. And that is uh, worrying. Um, so I hope that the positive news of that we will go to zero helps countries to also put their short-term policies in place. But there's still a long way to go. Claire. Uh, great. Yeah. So I think with this with this big gap in mind, um, we hope that our new rating system kind of addresses the, the complicated world that we're in and ultimately provides a bit of like a fairer and a better match to what needs to be done over the next decade to meet the Paris Agreement. And um, I hope that this presentation has helped you guys to understand that and, and empower you to use um, a lot of the work that we've put in to, to really hold your governments accountable and to, to push for more action across all of the different components that we've looked at. Now, Louise? Thanks, Claire. Yeah, I um, find our new rating system really quite interesting and useful and uh, in preparing it has been fascinating to really learn about what's going on in the different countries. And in particular, I found this component that I described earlier in terms of being able to analyze what countries are doing in terms of international climate finance, super important. And uh, as with Claire, I hope you also find that useful. Um, I think it the the framework of our analysis and also then actually doing that analysis really highlights the the major gap that is there. Um, we see it as fundamental for countries to actually meet their overall fair share contribution. Um, it's fundamental for international cooperation and supporting each other to actually achieve the Paris Agreement goal. Um, but right now it's just not happening and not to the scale that we need it to. Um, and so I think my, my biggest takeaway from the whole year of developing the methodology is that we really need to ramp up climate finance. Uh, and that's what I'm hoping that we see in the next few weeks and years ahead. Bill. Thanks, Louise. Thanks, colleagues. Look, I'll be very brief. I, I think I endorse everything that's been said. I'm just personally most worried about the, the big gap in 2030 because you know uh, we know that if we don't really close that gap it's going to be very hard and very costly to hold warming to one and a half degrees and to do that we need not just um, ramped up mitigation promises and pledges and actions we also need as Louise said finance because that's I think one of the big gaps is holding a lot of developing countries coming 
coming forward with more ambitious commitments is the finance is just not on the table. Uh, I think the richer countries know they have not met their obligations. So I think that combination is something that we need to look ahead at Glasgow to actually solve. Uh, the gap uh, will be narrowed a bit, but I'm convinced it would not be enough, unfortunately, in Glasgow. But I think we need to really uh, narrow the political ambition gap. And that's what I'm looking at, at Glasgow to do so that we can come out of Glasgow with a very strong process to continually upgrade uh, mitigation and also climate finance. Back to you, Claire. First of all. Great. Uh, thank you, Bill, and thank you to the rest of the panel, as well as um, all of the participants for joining us today. Just a brief reminder, the recording of this webinar, as well as our slides, will be available on the CAT website, and I encourage you to visit the website often as we have all of our country analysis and much further detail on the methodology available there, and a lot of analysis um, in the pipeline to come out between now uh, and the COP. So thank you very much for your attention, and have a nice day, everyone. Thank you, everyone.